Welcome to the second uh, uh, Komsky Churchill talk, and I'm going to be talking about sublinear time property testing. So property testing really asks the question, does a given input satisfy a fixed property? And the question of tonight really is how fast can we make these uh, property testers, and especially can we make them in sublinear time? To understand why sublinear time is so special, we first need to look at classical algorithms. Um, so in classical algorithms, they tend to be, uh, they actually always are deterministic, which has the useful property that given a certain input, it always gives us back the same output. Um, this has a disadvantage though. Uh, they need to consider the entirety of the input because otherwise they can't distinguish between two different inputs. This in turn means that they need to look at, uh, as I said, at the entirety of the input, which means we have a lower bound of omega n on how fast the algorithm can run because we have to look at the entire input and the entire input is of size n. However, data sets are growing and they're growing and they don't seem to stop growing. So really the question is, is that a lower bound we can't like, uh, go faster as? Can we go sublinear? And the answer is, uh, yes, we can go faster if we allow for randomization. So essentially, we're only gonna look at a fraction of the input. So a property tester is given a, a property, a Boolean predicate, and we're given an unknown function that serves as the input. So imagine an array uh, as a function, we can give it an index and we get, uh, we get the input, we get the value of the array at the supplied index. And what we're supposed to do is to distinguish between the case that F satisfies this property P or that it is epsilon far from satisfying the property P. Epsilon far is gonna be some notion of closeness we're gonna discuss further. But for the moment, you can just imagine it as we're only allowed to modify a fraction epsilon of the input. And secondly, we're also allowed to make a mistake. That uh, error probability only has to be small, strictly smaller than a third. Um, a third is a slightly arbitrary value. It could be any constant value, uh, strictly smaller than a half. And the reason for that is we can run the property tester several times and take a majority vote and thus decrease our error probability as much as we want to. Um, realize that this is as essentially a decision problem, that ha decision problem that has been relaxed in two ways. One is a normal decision problem would only consider the cases F satisfying the property and F not satisfying the property. Here we're allowed to just need to be just from some distance away from the property. And secondly, we're allowed to make mistakes. So let's look at an example of what uh, property could be we want to test for. So we have an input, uh, a binary input of size n, so it could be just an array with ones and filled with ones and zeros. And uh, we want to test for the property whether a uh, fixed binary, binary fixed string S is uh, not contained as a subsequence, or whether uh, this property is epsilon far away from the input. Uh, so far here is gonna be modifying at most a fraction of the uh, epsilon of the input, but more precisely that means we're allowed to modify epsilon n many um, places of the input because uh, such that it satisfies the property. And then for the rest of this talk, I'm gonna denote the error probability with delta, so please remember that. Um, so formalizing this notion of closeness, a uh, formal definition could look something like this. We have our input function f, that goes from a domain capital D to a range capital F, and it's said to be epsilon close to satisfying the property. If we can find another function that actually satisfies the property and only, it only differs in epsilon, uh, the magnitude of the domain many places. Um, the domain of the function can change. So we'll, as I just said in the previous example, uh, that means we can change epsilon n many uh, places of the input. But for example, for graphs, we'll see a slightly uh, different definition of the domain. Um, also, please don't, uh, just a bit of terminology, if we say that an input is epsilon close to satisfying a property P, that is the same as saying that it's epsilon far from the property. So if it's not epsilon close, it's epsilon far. I will use those interchangeably. So now, going back to the, the example, uh, to, anyway, sorry. Um, remember that we're trying to build sublinear time property testers which means that we need to only look at a fraction of the input. We want to minimize this fraction of the input we're looking at. So essentially we want to minimize the amount of times we query the input. And we can capture this notion using query complexity. Namely, what is the number of times we have to query the input? Um, query complexity is a hard lower bound on time complexity because every, uh, every query takes all one time. So we can't 
run any faster than our parallel complexity, which also means that it's harder to reduce than the time complexity. So for the property testers, people fo uh, focus on uh, query complexity. And also, please don't confuse this with the sample complexity Peter introduced last week, um, because that is passive. We are given examples of the function's values. Well, in this case, we're actively querying the input. So going back to our example uh, of figuring out whether the fixed binary string is not contained in the input. And let S be uh, defined of the bits V0, V1, uh, and so on and so forth until Vm. And so to begin with, we'll query the input uh, uniformly uh, linear in uh, one over epsilon. So notice that as epsilon gets smaller, so as we try to be uh, more precise, uh, we'll query more input locations. And then we pick uh, the instance of V0 that's leftmost in the graph. So, or to put it differently, we, put, we pick V0 with the smallest index. Uh, this is a greedy choice, but it's a greedy choice that intuitively makes sense, because we want to leave as much of the input untouched, because we can only look at the right of the input once we've picked the index of V0, uh, because we need S to be a subsequence. And now we inductively continue. Um, so we inductively, uh, for the string V1 to Vm, we again query the input, uh, linear in the number of one over epsilon, and again, pick the smallest query, uh, smallest index uh, with the instance of V1 we're trying to find. The only thing we're changing uh, during this inductive step is that we're having our parameter epsilon. The reason for this will become clear later on. Uh, and so whether we accept the input is quite easy. If we fail to find uh, S as a subsequence, so if we fail to find a specific bit of S, we accept it, else we reject it. Note that um, if the algorithm rejects the input, that means that we found S as a subsequence. So the property tester does more than just testing for the property. It gives us also proof if the property uh, is not true. Um, so how do we prove that algorithm? Well, the first thing we need to do is, uh, if the input is accepted with a probability greater than the error probability, so we're pretty sure that we're not, we're sure that we're not making a mistake, then we need to show that the input is actually epsilon close to not containing S. And then secondly, we need to show that actually our error probability is strictly smaller than a third. So consider our input as a line that doesn't show up very well, but anyway. Um, and I0 is the index where we found our leftmost instance of V0, and I1 is the leftmo leftmost instance to the right of I0 where we found V1, and uh, so on and so forth. So we're gonna operate under the assumption, which is a reasonable assumption, as I'll show later, that uh, we found an instance of V0 that's relatively early. So more precisely, it's within the first epsilon over two and many instances of V0. And that is important because if our index of uh, V0 was entirely to the right, our fraction of the input for which we could find the rest of the string V1 to Vm would be tiny and our, um, and our algorithm would just have a poor look at the entirety of the input. So well, to show that uh, the input is epsilon close to not containing S, what we do is we actually change the input uh, such that it doesn't contain S anymore. To do this, we flip all the bits between uh, the start of the input and I0 that are equal to the value of V0. So without loss of generality, say that V0 is equal to one. We flip all the ones between here and here to zero, which means that S cannot be contained in this first partition anymore. And then again, using our induction, we can continue and say, let's say I, uh, V1 is equal to uh, one again, and we flip all the bits that are one to zeros again in the second partition. So what we have done is we flipped all the bits uh, that are here that are one to zero, so S cannot be contained here. We've done the same thing for the second partition, so S cannot be contained here again. And inductively we continue, so S cannot be contained in this partition either. Since uh, we accepted the input, we failed at some point to find a bit of S. So that means that at the uh, input locations that we, uh, where we, uh, that we uh, wrote down as indices here, S is actually not contained in these uh, indices as well. So S is not contained in the entirety of the input. Now let's count how many bits we actually flipped. Well, since we assume that we found uh, a, an instance of V0 within the first epsilon over two and many uh, instances of V0, we at most flipped epsilon times n divided by too many bits. And here comes the fact that we have the parameter epsilon at every, every inductive step 
uh, and helps us because now we only flipped epsilon n over four many bits because epsilon uh, uh, decreased. Now summing up all these bits, you can quite easily see that the sum uh, just tends to epsilon n. So we actually only flipped epsilon n many bits and the worst case, and our input is epsilon close to not containing s. Um, so how do we prove that actually this assumption is valid so that we hit this set of the first epsilon over two n many instances? So for the purpose of this, just assume that v naught is equal to one, but could equally be equal to zero. Um, and consider the probability of hitting this set. Well, first consider the probability of not hitting this uh, set uh, with our first query. It's one minus epsilon over two. Uh, and then we need to fail uh, as many times as we query the input. So k times one over epsilon many times. And then one minus this gives us the lower bound on a success, success probability. Um, remember that the limit uh, as n tends to infinity of this term tends to one over e. And that what we have here looks quite similar as epsilon tends to zero. So we can simply rewrite this as one minus e to the power of minus k. Now choosing an appropriate uh, value for k, we can uh, make this uh, success probability uh, very high, namely one minus two to the power of some term in it linear in the length, or depending on the length of the string. So this means that uh, the success probability decreases at every uh, inductive step because our string decreases at every step. But on the other hand, it gives us that we only use linear amount of queries in uh, uh, one over epsilon. And now adding up all these errors, because we can make this error every time uh, we query the input again for every single bit of s, summing up uh, the failure probability, we get an error probability that must be strictly smaller than a quarter because the sum is just saying an eighth plus a 16 plus a 30 second will be smaller than a, um, than a quarter. So um, let, let's look back at the entirety of the algorithm. The number of queries is uh, linear in one over epsilon because uh, it only depends on the size of the fixed string S which is constant and one over epsilon. Um, so notice that this is O1 in the input size. So it doesn't matter whether our input is two gigabytes long or 100 megabytes long, we'll run in the same amount of time. The only condition is that it needs to fit in memory. So we're extremely fast. Um, also notice that uh, querying the input takes O1 time. So in total, we just have the same time complexity as the query complexity. And then let's look at why we actually need both delta and epsilon, similarly to what Peter did last week, which was probably and approximately. Um, Imagine that we actually don't hit the set of the first epsilon uh, over two times n many instances. I could have just very unfortunate queries and not hit a one uh, in the first time we query the input. That's why we need delta to prevent, to account for this case. And we need epsilon because we don't see the entirety of the input. So we can't make sure that the input does not contain s anywhere we haven't looked. So we actually need both. Um, and now the question is, can we achieve similar uh, algorithms on more complex data structures such as graphs? And as Edgar gave away, yes, we can. So um, property testing on graphs has actually uh, had a lot of research done on it. Uh, and we're gonna look at the fundamental uh, property of bipartiteness and see if we can test a graph whether or not it's bipartite. Does everybody remember what bipartiteness is? Okay. Um, so our input function uh, will allow us to query whether an edge is in the graph or not. So given two vertices, we'll be able to ask, ask the function, ask the input, whether or not the edge is in the graph. So it makes the most sense to store the graph as a matrix, because then we have all one time to do the query. Um, if we had an incident list, that would take, uh, could in the worst case, take ON time. So the, depending on the queries we want to do on the input, we might choose a different way of storing uh, our input. Um, so, Formalizing our notion of closeness, for a graph, we say it's epsilon close if we only need to change epsilon n squared edges, where n is the number of vertices. And the algorithm is about the simplest thing you can think of. We take some vertices uniformly drawn from the input. We check whether the edges between the vertices are in the graph, and then we use our set x and our knowledge of which edges are in the graph or not to induce a subgraph and we check if it's bipartite. If it's bipartite, then we accept, else we reject. It's quite hard to come up with something that's much simpler as an algorithm. The cool part is, it still works. Um, so looking a bit closer at it, uh, 
we can check that GX is bipartite using breadth first search because breadth first search will tell us whether or not there's an odd cycle length. If there's an odd cycle length, then the uh, GX is not bipartite. And since breadth first search runs in linear time within, with the edges, uh, and we query whether each edge is in the graph or not, we have a total, uh, we have our time complexity, which is equal to our query complexity, which is again, O1 in the input, because we never actually care on how big the input is. It only depends on our parameters, epsilon and delta. Um, also notice that the property tester again has the useful property that, uh, has the property that if G is actually bipartite, then so is GX, and we will always accept. So we can never give a false negative by saying that the graph is actually bipartite, but we'll reject because of our error probability. No, we'll always, if the graph is bipartite, we'll return bipartite. And then secondly, if GX is not bipartite, then G cannot be either. So again, we have proof of the fact that the, uh, uh, overlying, underlying input is actually not bipartite due to the odd cycle length presented by a breadth first search. Uh, so what we really need to prove is whether or not GX is accepted with a probability greater than our error probability. Uh, and in that case, G needs to be epsilon close to being bipartite. So the proof is actually quite complicated, but it uses a clever trick. So what we do is from an analysis point of view only, we'll split up, we'll reuse the set X that we picked and split it into two, into two different sets, U and S. And essentially, you can imagine this to be some sort of generate and test, because what U will do is it will allow us to induce a partition on the entire graph, and then S will test this, part, uh, this partition. And what we want to achieve is that uh, we fail the test on S when the, entire, when, the, uh, when the partition induced on the entire graph is actually uh, not by, uh, epsilon close to bipartite. So how do we induce this partition on, on the entire graph? So let's say we have a bipartite partition U1 and U2, uh, and we want to induce a partition on the entire graph, uh, on the, all the vertices of the graph. What we say is that the first uh, partition, V1, is the set of all neighbors of U2. So that means there's an edge between a vertex in U2 and uh, a vertex in V1. And then V2 is the set of all remaining vertices because we need to assign them to one of the two partitions. And we try to partition S such that together, uh, we try to find a bipartite partition on S such that together with the bipartite partition on U, uh, they form a bipartite uh, partition on the entirety of the set X. We know that this bipartite partition on X exists because our algorithm returned it already. But the point being is, here's the test, uh, that here's the use of S. If the partition V1 and V2 is epsilon far from bipartiteness, then with high probability we cannot partition S such that we find a bipartite partition X. But in reverse, since we do know that there is a bipartite partition on it, bipartite partition X, and we accepted the input, we know that the entire graph is epsilon close to bipartiteness. Um, so to understand the entire proof, there's one more uh, idea to look at, and that's uh, where do our uh, violating edges actually come from, so the edges that violate bipartiteness. So we'll consider the edges incident on uh, vertices with low numbering of uh, neighboring vertices. We call them non-influential vertices because they shape the graph. They don't really shape the graph because they have such few neighbors and such few edges. Uh, we'll try to have the set of, uh, the set of edges uh, that are incident on non-influential vertices will ignore because what we'll uh, do is that we'll make sure that the, the number of edges incident on non-influential vertices is so small that we can capture it within our epsilon n squared. So we can always change them if need be. Then obviously if we have non-influential vertices, we also have influential vertices. And they can either be neighbors in U, they have, na have neighbors in U, so we have seen them, we have some idea that they exist, or we might not know that they exist, uh, or we might know that they exist. Um, and again, we need to limit the number of influential vertices we haven't seen because they won't be tested by our test set S. So this needs to also be limited by epsilon n squared. So to do that, we need to assume that U actually contains enough influential vertices. And if it does not, uh, and this assumption will be uh, captured by our error probability. And in total, all of these sources of uh, by edges violating bipartiteness need to be below uh, epsilon n squared. Um, this should be enough to understand the proof if you want to read up on it yourself. The, all that's left is some technical bits showing that 
actually we can uh, show that there's gonna be enough influential vertices in U um, uh, with high enough probability. And if you want to read it up, feel free. It's on the following, in the following paper um, written by Odette Goldreich, Shafi Goldwasser, and Dana Ron. So where does delta come from? I've alluded to the first reason where delta com comes in. You might not be representative of the graph. So it might not see enough in, have enough influential vertices and not see enough of the graph. Um, so we need to show that you contain sufficient amount of edges, and that's the first part. And the second part is we might pass the test on S when we actually shouldn't. So we might accept the input uh, because we passed the test on S from an analysis point of view when we shouldn't because the graph is actually not epsilon close to bipartite. And essentially that means that there was too many violating edges in the neighbors of U. So we need to make this test hard enough. And that's the second technical part of the proof. Once we have done those two bits, we're essentially done and uh, can show that the algorithm actually satisfies all the properties we wanted to satisfy. So property, coming back to property testing on graphs in a more general sense, uh, similar techniques can be used to create other testers. So for example, for k-colorability, we do something very similar. In k colorability again, we pick a set of vertices, we let it induce a subgraph, and we check that subgraph for whether or not it's k-colorable. The only difference being that when we check for k-colorability, we need exponential time, even on the subgraph. Because as far as we know so far, there is no quicker test for k-colorability than an exponential one. So the time complexity is actually not equal to the query complexity, because what we do with the information we extracted from the graph actually takes exponential time. Uh, this, this again reiterates the point that query complexity is really our lower bound, and that's why we try to minimize it. Similarly, the technique to prove uh, the test on bipartiteness can be also reused for k-colorability and other um, graph property testers. So the, uh, the idea of reusing the set X from an analysis point of view into U and S is actually quite important. And sometimes this idea doesn't on only get used from an analysis point of view, but it actually gets used in the algorithm. But uh, that's reserved for more complicated algorithms where the natural tester of doing what uh, we just did, just pick some vertices, induce a subgraph, and then test the subgraph is not good enough. Um, so remember that the, the, property tester is, uh, the property tester for bipartiteness provided us proof of the graph not being bipartite if we rejected it because we found an odd cycle length. This is extremely useful if you want to run a deterministic tester afterwards, because what happens is that uh, we run the property tester, and if it rejects the input, then we have proof of it and don't need to run the determining test, the deterministic tester. So we get a best case in case of the input being very far away from bipartisanness. That is much better. So uh, we can try to optimize our deterministic testers for inputs that are actually close to bipartiteness. And this is a very uh, useful property because it does more than just a property testing. We init initially asked of it. So how does, how does property f testing fit into the bigger picture? Well, property testing um, naturally emerged from program checking. Uh, the paradigm in program checking really is uh, we test for certain properties of the program and then we actually just check that the program computes the function we want it to. So what we do in practice is we have this function, we property test this pro function for certain properties, and then we check the function. Um, similarly, uh, it relates quite a lot to learning theory, specifically packed learning. So in both, they're quite similar, because in both we're given an unknown function, but with two different aims. In learning theory, we try to approximate this function, while in testing, we only try to determine whether a certain property holds about this function. This might give you the impression that uh, property testing is actually easier than learning theory, than learning the function, but that's not necessarily true. So testing is easier for, uh, than learning for proper learning that Peter described last week. But it actually, in certain non-proper learning uh, cases, it is more difficult to test than to learn. Um, the examples of that are quite complicated, but uh, if you want to after the talk, I can point you to papers uh, where you can read up on those. Um, also, we can actually use testing inside of learning theory. So if you want to approximate a function, we can do something similar in program checking. We first test whether some properties hold, 
and then using the assumption that those properties hold, we can actually try to approximate the function. And then one area that I haven't been able to touch on is distributional property testing. So one example question of distributional property testing would be, given an input distribution, is it close to another fixed distribution or not? And let me give you an example of why this is actually an interesting question. So imagine you're running a website and you have a detailed record of the distribution of your visitors and you change something about your website. So for example, you present some new cool proof and you want to see whether or not the distribution of your visitors has changed. You can test whether or not the distribution is still close to your old distribution and uh, distributional property testing will tell you with a certain probability whether that holds or not. Um, another important question in distributional property testing is how many samples do we need? So one difference between distributional property testing and the property testing I've shown so far is that distributional property testing, we don't query the input, but we get samples of the input. Um, so again, it's this change from being active uh, towards the input versus being passive and given examples. So let's conclude. Um, We've seen that some property testers are extremely fast. They run in O1 time with the input. That is not necessarily true for um, all property testers, but all property testers have the requirement of trying to be sublinear. Otherwise, there's not much point to having a property tester in the first place, because that was really our goal, to beat the lower bound we had for deterministic algorithms. Um, one thing that should be noted as well is that certain properties are not necessarily testable. They're considered evasive, and there is certain theorems uh, again, if you want to, uh, to show that a property is evasive. But in this talk, we really focused on uh, property testers that work, and we focused on the query complexity of them. And uh, yeah, sorry, we focused on the query complexity and not on time complexity, because query complexity is a lower bound. Um, and then you might have noticed, but the algorithms tend to be quite simple. But they do have a fairly sophisticated analysis, and that is a theme that drags throughout all of property testing, that the algorithms are fairly simple. There's not that much fancy stuff you can do, but you really show off your skill when you're doing the analysis of your algorithm. And final, the final thing I should mention is that property testing is actually a very active area of research. Um, there's many open problems that are being solved continuously. So for example, property testing has um, evolved to also considering uh, streaming. So streaming is we have sublinear space rather than sublinear time. So people have tried to combine the two to sublinear property testing where you're both sublinear in space and in time. So do you have any questions?